So this is Fred Starr. I'm sitting in Washington, D.C., uh, chairman of the Central Asia Caucuses Institute, and welcome to all of you in behalf of our institute, in behalf of the Rumsfeld Foundation, and in behalf of the entire uh, Kamka Network, uh, uh, welcome. And we'd like to turn to right now to, the, unfortunately, the last of our sessions, um, and in many respects, perhaps the most important, because in the last few years, there's been much talk, as you all know, about regionalism in Central Asia, including Afghanistan. But this discussion has extended across the Caspian to the countries of the Caucasus, and it has included Mongolia at key points. And so regionalism has been very much in the, in the air. This has led to study of foreign models for, for regional cooperation. Uh, the Nordic Council, ASEAN, indeed, our Kamka group with the Central Asia Caucasus Institute and the Rumsfeld Foundation made a study trip to Singapore to, to examine how ASEAN does its work. So today, though, as you all know, the region faces grave economic, social, and political challenges. So our topic today is to focus only on the economic dimensions of regionalism and, and to see how does this, uh, how do current circumstances, both economic, political, medical, if you will, epidemiological, how do these circumstances affect the growth or retard the uh, development of regional trade, regional investment, regional interaction. We have, we have wonderfully qualified people, uh, all of whom have been uh, fellows uh, and uh, who are waiting to speak. And we're going to lead off with Shukrat Mirzoyev from Tajikistan. He is founder and managing partner of Irshad Consulting LLC. Irshad, welcome. You have the floor. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Starr. Um, let me begin by saying what an honor and privilege it is to be sharing the stage, uh, at least virtually for now, with you, all Kamka fellows, and um, everyone who is watching this panel right now. Uh, what I want to do with my seven minutes is try to explain very briefly why the focus on, on increased intra-regional trade between Kamka countries is justified, and at the same time, uh, although I'm not a big picture guy, I will try to explain the nature of intra-regional trade and the overall environment within Kamka. Uh, from my own perspective. Uh, before the pandemic, um, total trade um, in the Kamka region reached um, around $11 billion in 2019 and has increased by more than eight times in the past 10 years. Um, its total output, in other words, uh, the combined GDP of all 10 Kamka countries was around $400 billion uh, by the end of 2019. So that's a lot of uh, 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 that's a lot of goods and services produced, uh, which uh, essentially implies that these figures tell a relatively good story of steady and uh, gradual expansion of economies and trades within Kamka. Um, although total output dipped uh, at least twice in my recent memory in, uh, following the global economic financial crisis and then um, uh, in 2015 and 16, um, this was a negative spillover effect which continues to put a significant risk to, um, to the Kamka region, except maybe Afghanistan and Mongolia. Um, uh, when, um, when destination of experts um, uh, within the Kamka region appears to be diversified, in my opinion, the composition of experts is often dominated by oil and gas. For example, Azerbaijan's exports are uh, around 91% oil and petroleum products. Um, same with Kazakhstan, where, all, where oil represents 65% of all experts. Um, overall, there are, as we know, four out of 10 Kamka countries that are oil producers, which essentially exposes them to unique risks such as Dutch disease. And um, we're, I'm happy to, to talk about this a little bit further during uh, Q&A as well. Um, besides, uh, almost a quarter of all manufacturing jobs in the Kamka region depend on experts, which is very important. But sadly, um, we have, um, uh, by you know, close inspection, um, have found out that the composition of experts in smaller countries such as Armenia, Kyrgyzstan, or Tajikistan have only marginally changed in the past 20 years. So that's uh, 
uh, that's the flip uh, flip side of that uh, of that good story. To make matters worse, um, close inspection of bilateral trade between uh, our countries can be very um, very interesting um, for interpretation in terms of inter interpretation. For example, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan account for almost a third of total trade uh, in Kamka, but on the other hand, there is zero trade. Um, say between Mongolia and Tajikistan, or between Armenia um, and Tajikistan, or Afghanistan and um, and a number of Kamka countries. Uh, uh, so the bottom line um, uh, from that is that despite steady growth in trade in the Kamka region over the past 10 to 15 years, as a region, I think uh, in the context of uh, our discussion, I believe that we are starting from a very low base. Um, market size of the Kamka region is also growing, uh, but population growth is nuanced with uh, very significant disparities across our countries. Um, we have also discussed this during um, our fellowship presentation uh, back in fall 2019. On the one hand, for example, in the past 20 years, the population of Afghanistan increased by almost 90%, um, which is massive nearly doubled in the past 20 years. But on the other hand, there are countries where uh, market size has effectively declined, such as Armenia and Georgia. In Georgia, for example, in the past 20 years, population has declined by almost 9%. Um, while this is mainly attributed to emigration, um, expected population decrease in the coming decades uh, may effectively undermine the um, attractiveness of these countries as major export destinations. Um, due to declining workforce and size of their markets, this would also affect total trade. Um, and in my opinion, this is why greater intensity of trade with fellow Kamka countries um, with similarly small market size and absorptive capacity of imported commodities may have its long-term benefits. Um, and um, I'd like to briefly touch upon uh, the three big things, uh, as I call them, happening now in the Kamka region. Um, the first one, COVID-19. I think... Um, it is fair to say that the uh, economic impact of the pandemic has caught everyone by surprise. Um, although some countries such as Tajikistan, um, where I'm from, which by the way was the last country in the Kamka region to record its first coronavirus infection case, had time and resources to adjust and reduce impact on the economy but failed to do much. Um, for instance, there were many smallholder farmers and individual entrepreneurs engaged in cross-border trade um, with countries um, uh, with Uzbekistan or Kyrgyzstan and um, Afghanistan, which have been hit particularly hard by uh, self-isolation measures and uh, border closures. Even as far back as January, not many of us, I believe, expected border closures, a complete grounding of passenger flights, restrictions um, uh, on business activity uh, for two and in some cases three months. This has had a profound uh, implication generally on uh, some of the macroeconomic fundamentals, including trade. Uh, based on um, uh, our own latest growth projections, and we're also doing uh, some macro stuff ourselves as an alternative uh, to, uh, to government estimates, uh, government figures, official figures. The total size of the, uh, of the Kamka economy generally is estimated to shrink on average by around 19% nominally in 2020. Um, year on year uh, compared to the previous year. Unless a second wave of the pandemic hits in, um, such, as, uh, such, such as seems to be the case in Kazakhstan, uh, in which case uh, the fall in total trade among Kamka countries would be between 12 and 19% over the course of the year. I think exports are still not going to recover anytime soon. Um, this, in my view, takes um, the pressure off somewhat um, expert promotion and investment promotion agencies because they have um, some uh, further breathing space and in turn presents a good opportunity for readjustment and new trade partnerships. Um, we're already seeing um, in countries like Tajikistan here uh, that firms in a number of sectors, most notably in manufacturing, um, in pharmaceutical industry, in ICT, which are readjusting to the new normal, which uh, presents uh, opportunities for trade across borders. Uh, the second uh, point is pressure to diversify economies. This is an emerging trend which is happening against the backdrop of um, remittances driven growth models um, that uh, prevail in several Kamka countries such as Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan and the sharp drop of prices of key commodities such as copper, aluminium, cotton, wheat um, and of course most notably the price of oil since 2018. Uh, for instance, the price of copper went down by almost 20% um, between 2018 and 2020, while prices of aluminium and cotton have also declined on average by 
uh, 30% and 28%. Uh, uh, just a reminder why it's important. Copper ore is the biggest export commodity for Armenia and Georgia, 24 and 15% respectively, um, around those numbers. Um, and the second biggest export commodity for Mongolia. Similarly, cotton um, is one of the major export commodities for Uzbekistan and, and Tajikistan. Uh, so this is very significant. Um, I think uh, another concern is that um, uh, related to this is that the, the World Bank uh, estimates um, um, show that um, pre-2018 prices uh, of some of these key commodities are unlikely to pick up until 2030. So we're looking into a long-term uh, forward uh, to, to a long-term negative trend. But this should raise at least a few eyebrows uh, among policymakers and leadership in our uh, key economic institutions across uh, our Kamka countries. So, um, um, uh, in, uh, as far as oil is concerned, although oil prices have uh, picked up from negative values in the past few months, they also remain highly volatile. And frankly, the future of oil is very, very uncertain. Um, uh, uh, this is where um, I think uh, trade comes into play, uh, particularly as the transition to a post-oil um, future is very realistic and will involve potentially significant challenges. And we're talking about long-term game plan, essentially, because um, at the moment, unfortunately, with the exception of high-flying reformer in uh, Uzbekistan, there are few signs that oil exporting countries in the Kamka region are ready for such a transition. Um, and um, one of the key elements of that transition is diversifying production and um, uh, experts. Um, therefore, uh, for at least four oil producing countries in the Kamka region looking to diversify and increase trade uh, with fellow neighbors in the Kamka region seems like the rational thing to do from a, from a purely economic standpoint. And lastly, um, the third point is an opportunity for economic rebalancing. Um, chaos and an opportunity for economic rebalancing. Uh, rebalancing. This is chaos because um, I think some governments hesitated to take st uh, stricter measures to protect the economy, uh, while others did too little too late to safeguard businesses and protect trade. And I'm uh, talking not only about Tajikistan, um, uh, but also um, other neighboring countries, not only in Central Asia, but, but in the Caucasus, um, with the, perhaps with the exception of Georgia and Uzbekistan. Uh, the outcome is, um, of course, poor crisis mitigation and response coordination among key economic institutions in many of our countries. Um, one of the key issues related to that is that many uh, countries in the Kamka region continue to depend on the health of the Russian economy through remittances and trade channels, or both. Um, even countries like Georgia continue uh, to trade with Russia, 11.5% uh, roughly of all Georgian exports in 2019 went to Russia, uh, which is still its second largest export destination. Um, in this context, um, I think Kamka countries are deeply divided in their trade opportunities due to um, uh, membership in the Eurasian Economic Union, which presents a very real um, and significant uh, stumbling block uh, to intensifying trade uh, between us, um, between our countries, and uneven progress in post-WTO accession planning. Um, and um, this time, I think, uh, is also an opportunity for rebalancing because there is a growing agreement among the Kamka countries that this disproportionate economic dependency on Russia or increasingly China uh, one might say, through its BRI investment, imported goods and concessional lending is a recipe for disaster. I think this is an additional incentive. It should be an additional incentive for all our countries to trade more um, with each other. Uh, so with this, um, uh, with this thought, um, uh, let me stop here and um, over to you, Dr. Stark. Dr. Fred, you are muted. Dr. Stahl, you are muted, sorry. Uh, can you please unmute your mic? Can you please unmute your mic, Dr. Uh, Stahl? Uh, we don't hear I, you. And I have to drop back. Yeah, please. I, let's thank uh, Shukrat Mirzoyev for most comprehensive and very interesting presentation. We're now going to hear from Sardar Muhammad Aliyev of uh, Uzbekistan, who's Chief Business Development Officer of Zod Mall, the Swiss-based leading online shopping marketplace. So 
Sardor, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Starr. It's a great uh, pleasure to me to be on a stage uh, virtually. It's always a pleasure to meet the fellows and uh, regional experts. Uh, thank you so much, the Shukrat, for giving us a high-level snapshot of the Kamka region and the key metrics. Uh, I'm going to share with you some of the key uh, products for the export uh, and the, what are the barriers and the problems and, and also opportunities uh, to make this Kamka region more attractive uh, in terms of the intra-regional trade. So, uh, as you know, uh, in this uh, region, uh, currently living more than uh, 133 million people and it's uh, growing and it's a good trend that uh, it's uh, not a small region in terms of uh, doing business. So if we uh, consider, we analyze the products and we, if we consider top 10 exported uh, products, uh, mainly they are the natural resources. And in the, in the first, uh, it's the mineral fuel, which, which Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan is greatly contributing. And second uh, product is a gold. Uh, you know, uh, I'm broadcasting from Tashkent, Uzbekistan, and Uzbekistan is one of the biggest gold exporters. Uh, if you see uh, even the this year dynamics uh, from the January till the May, Uzbekistan is uh, exported 1.6 billion dollars of the gold, which makes uh, almost 32 percent of the total export share. And and also third uh, product is the cotton. Uh, Uzbekistan is also a great contributor together with the Tajikistan and the cotton part, uh, and it's very famous. And the fourth thing is the coal and copper. Here are the major contributors, also neighboring Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and other Kamka countries. And the fifth product, which is mostly exported, is uh, iron and steel. And the sixth is, uh, thanks to Mongolia, they are contributing very good on the cashmere and the wool. And the seventh uh, most sold product is the chemicals. Uh, in Uzbekistan, in Kazakhstan, and other Kamka countries, they are also contributing for the export of chemicals. And eight is uh, livestock. Nine is uh, fruits and the nuts. Uh, and also here is the Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, Georgia, also the great uh, exporters of these products. And the last 10, top 10 product is the uh, spirits and the beverages. Uh, here is thanks to uh, Georgian wines and Armenian uh, cognacs. So they are contributing uh, to the ex and the making an export uh, from the Kamka region. So, uh, and the, if, if we analyze the past eight years, uh, it has not changed so much, but uh, beyond this, it has a good potential uh, of uh, selling not only resources, but also the products to increase the value of the export. So what are the key challenges? The key challenges we divide into two parts and the policy level and the enterprise level. The policy level is uh, first, we can highlight that the customs and the trade regime. Uh, because, you know, uh, region is a complicated, so that's why it's a complicated custom clearance processes. Another thing is the infrastructure, the poor logistic infrastructure and the transport corridors. Next thing is the regulations and the governance. Uh, still, we have an unstable business environment in some Kamka countries, uh, and also the corruption still exists. Another important point is the trend trade financing. Uh, due to strict regulations for the international money transfer and the lack of international payment players, uh, this is some uh, bottleneck of developing the trade and the intra-regional trade. If we go into the enterprise level, uh, so first, uh, the barrier uh, can be the lack of knowledge on the regional trade potential, because most people does not really uh, explore. As the Shukrat mentioned, the, some Kamka countries, they don't have any trade uh, relations between among them. So these uh, opportunities should be uh, investigated, explored, and there is a good potential to develop them. And another uh, issue on the enterprise level is a buyer trust issue. Unfortunately, we have the several cases, uh, even my friends who are doing the business, uh, they have lost their businesses or money or their product due to not verified uh, buyers. Uh, thanks to COVID, now e-commerce is uh, very developing and uh, unfortunately uh, we have in the region very low e-commerce maturity still. So this is also can be one of the options to facilitate the trade. And uh, most of Kamka countries uh, speak Russian, but still we have uh, 
especially on the young generation, not uh, everyone is Russian speaking. And uh, so we have to unify also the languages as well. And uh, another important thing, and uh, this is the lack of competitive products uh, to be exported, uh, not only within the intra-regional, but also to the uh, US, China, or other European countries. So in terms of the competitiveness of the products, uh, we have also the, some barriers and the uh, lack of trading skills. Uh, so uh, what would be the recommendations uh, our to improve the interregional trade? Uh, first of all, uh, improve the infrastructure level uh, on the railway and the aviation. Second thing we can recommend a closer cooperation with the trade and uh, economy ministries uh, who are related, uh, who, are, uh, who are in the trade and helping the enterprises countries to improve the trade turnover. Uh, implementing uh, anti-corruption policy can be more uh, can help and make the trade more transparent. And also, we should improve the court system and implementing uh, arbitral court system with English law. Uh, Kazakhstan did uh, first uh, in the international Astana International Finance Center. So uh, another thing uh, on the policy level is cooperation with the export promotion organizations and the Chamber of Commerce of different countries and uh, to simplify the digital payment systems and in invite more international finance institutes. On the enterprise level, our recommendations will be so cooperation uh, more the business associations than the business clubs that can uh, they have their uh, network and they can be very helpful to increase the trade turnover uh, possibly creating the Kamka logistic hub and the Kamka business council uh, trade with the verified companies the, it can be online or offline platforms uh, and the supporting the e-commerce because e-commerce now is the key uh, because the pandemic showed that the uh, due to e-commerce and now we can deliver almost everything to our houses and it's a safe it's fast it's cheap so this is also good uh, uh, tool to increase the increase the trade and another thing is uh, as we mentioned transformation from resource to the ready product that can also create a good value and make the Kamka country's product uh, really valuable and branded uh, in the market. Thanks. This Thank is you just very a short much. update. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I there's no group of people in the entire Kamka region who deserve more notice internationally and more attention than they receive than the business community of Afghanistan. This is a very young business community, a lot of new faces, a lot of new organizations. And unfortunately, in many places in the world, people don't understand that they exist and, and are doing very clever things. Our next speaker is Abihula Zermal from uh, Afghanistan. He's CEO of CEFE Group International and first, vi uh, first vice chairman of the International Chamber of Commerce in Afghanistan. Zabi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Star. It's a pleasure and honor for me to be in this uh, today's virtual meeting. And I would like to uh, say hello and good morning to those who are watching us from Washington, D.C. and West and good evening for those from the Kamka region. Uh, I would like to uh, talk about the three uh, interesting topics. Uh, first, I would like to uh, give an overview about the economic prospects of the Kamka region, including the intra-regional uh, uh, trade and investments. Uh, then I will be focusing more on Afghanistan economic and political prospects, uh, plus the COVID-19 impact on the current and the future uh, of Afghanistan economy in the region. And finally, I would conclude my talking points with a few policy recommendations for the policymakers that how uh, the uh, level of the, and the volume of the trade could be uh, boosted in terms of the uh, regional and also how uh, efficient and effective connectivity could be maintained in order to facilitate more trade and investments within the Kamka region. 
Uh, if we look at the Kamka region, indeed, it's a very interesting region in terms of the diversity and in terms of the economies, although majority of the countries in the Kamka region are small uh, uh, economy countries, for example, despite, except of Kazakhstan, which is quite larger economy, the, and Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, and uh, 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 Uzbekistan, which is a medium-sized economy in terms of their GDP. The rest of the other countries in the region are all small economies in terms of their GDP. For example, Afghanistan is almost $20 billion GDP for the last year, and then the other countries are lower and less than that one. Uh, but still, this region is quite interesting uh, for uh, the global powers uh, within the region and also the global powers from all around the world, including the United States, Russia, uh, and China as well. Uh, in terms of the population, we can see that there is 133 million plus populations, uh, but majority of the young populations are uh, available in this region, while the level of the poor and the vulnerable population is also quite large. For example, in Afghanistan, despite of having a, a big number of young populations, as you mentioned, Dr. Starr, that the new faces from the business side and from the business sector is all uh, the young generations. But... Uh, uh, if you look at the number of the poor population, according to the latest World Bank report, we have got a 54.5% poor population, which is equal to 20 million populations uh, from the 38 million population, which is huge and a lot. And in terms of the trade, uh, uh, Afghanistan uh, is importing almost $7 billion uh, values of goods and commodities on an yearly basis. Like last year, we, we had import of $7 billion. Uh, our export was only around eight hundred and fifty million dollar, and for this year we have a target of uh, we had a target of a one billion dollar exports, but unfortunately the COVID nineteen pandemic has uh, uh, negatively affected that one, and I don't think so that we would be uh, reaching uh, that level. The level of unemployment is almost forty percent plus in Afghanistan, and uh, uh, fifty percent of the government expenditures and uh, cost of and, and uh, budget for our development projects is mainly dependent on the foreign aids, and which majority of those aid, that aid is coming from the United States. Uh, since the world currently is experiencing a very uh, serious and severe uh, uh, global recession in terms of the economy that almost uh, the world has been experiencing according to the latest World Bank report uh, in terms of the global economy, economy, uh, economic prospects, almost 5.2% contraction is expected to happen in 2020. And in terms of the Central Asia, if you look at that number, it's quite uh, smaller comparing to the developed countries and developing countries. It's almost only 1.7%. Uh, and uh, uh, the, I would like to just uh, focus a little bit more about the impacts of the COVID-19 in terms of Afghanistan economy. Although we have not been affected as much as the other countries are being affected because before the COVID-19, the number of, we, we heard we, our sector of the tourism was uh, not active. And also economy of Afghanistan, as I said, is, is most uh, dependent on the foreign aids. And also we, we couldn't attract uh, foreign direct investments into the potential sectors which we have in Afghanistan, such as mines, minerals, agribusinesses, manufacturing, and education and services. Uh, but still, the COVID-19 has uh, negatively impacted our economy, uh, although still we're not at the peak, but uh, it seems that uh, sometime soon, at least this region is going to be reaching to the peak, probably uh, that would be Afghanistan. If you look at the number of uh, new infected cases, we have got more numbers in Afghanistan comparing to any other countries in this region. Uh, since the last six months, this economic activities has been slowed down, Unemployment rate has been increasing day by day. Uh, most of the industries and the new and infant industries, which has uh, been started for the past few years, and a lot of investment has been done by, by the uh, local investors and the regional investors, uh, most of them has been altered because of due to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Our SME sector is quite fragile, and majority of them, I have seen many of the SMEs which has stopped with their announced bankruptcy uh, due to the lack of 
proper support and also due to the lack of availability of a stimulus package in support of the SME sector in Afghanistan. And although from the International Chamber of Commerce and Industries, which I'm one of the founders and uh, representing the ICC in Afghanistan, we have proposed specific policy recommendations, specific policies in terms of saving the ACMEs and supporting the ACMEs, but it's still uh, no specific and no uh, um, uh, measure has been taken and no actions has been taken in, uh, from the government side because the entire focus of the government and international partner is right now focusing on recovering and rebuilding the healthcare system of Afghanistan in order to avoid increasing number of mortalities uh, in the country. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, commodities prices, we see that all over the world has been collapsed. Uh, the demand for majority of the commodities that Afghanistan was importing uh, due to the uh, slowdown of the economies has been uh, decreased, while uh, the oil prices also has been flanked all around the world that Afghanistan was mainly importing it is hydrocarbons from uh, Turkmenistan, from Kazakhstan, and a little bit from uh, Uzbekistan. But at the same time, uh, an increasing demand has been considered for the foodstuffs and commodities, which is uh, for survival, like wheat flour, uh, uh, cooking oil, uh, uh, wheat itself from Kazakhstan. Uh, uh, and also, uh, uh, we see that uh, uh, the global chain supply uh, has uh, disrupted, and within, within the region also, uh, we have considered many a slow movement of the cargoes and also some trade barriers and limitations which has been put by the neighboring countries. A very good example of that one is uh, Kazakhstan. Since Afghanistan is mainly importing, it is wheat floors and wheat and uh, food items and commodities from Kazakhstan. Uh, since past three months, there was an import-export quota has been put, uh, which is limiting the number of exports out of Kazakhstan to Afghanistan and uh, other countries uh, uh, in the region. Uh, now the question is that what has to be done if the entire economy of the region is quite fragile and still we have not reached to the peak of the COVID-19 and I'm sure that it's going to happen uh, and the pandemic outbreak is something that the world has been experiencing and, and it's somehow unavoidable. It's not like the other phenomenon like terrorism, like war and fire, that by putting some measures, it could be avoided. Unfortunately, uh, do, do you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Yes. Okay, my internet is quite bad today. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, considering that one, I would uh, like to recommend some uh, specific measures which has to be taken in order to recover the economy post uh, at the post COVID nineteen uh, uh, era. Uh, first of all, the, the region needs uh, very strong cooperation and col collaboration, uh, comparing to any other time in the past, in order to first tackle the pandemic outbreaks and then to combat. Uh, it and also uh, uh, the second uh, re recommendation which I would put over here for the purpose of uh, post-COVID-19 recovery of the economy, uh, the region policymakers, the region politicians and the region economists has to work together and closely uh, through conducting more and continuous regional policy dialogues in order to reach to a unified regional integration policy in terms of promoting more trade and investments between their, their respective countries that should be for the best interest, interest of, of, of the respective uh, country. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, should be mentioned that in order to uh, have more volume of trade between the countries in the Kamka region, we need a massive number of infrastructure and regional infrastructure projects like the uh, railways in order to connect the countries in between each other and to connect the countries with the other regions of, uh, in, this, in this area, for example, the Central Asia with the South Asia, which needs uh, massive investments and uh, the countries in the region, they don't have sufficient funding and financing in order to support them, which needs uh, global uh, support and financing from the IMF, from the World Bank, from the great powers like the United States of America that 
somehow uh, has been involved with China, which they are having initiative of the BRI project and they want to influence into the region. As we can see that Kazakhstan has already uh, been benefited from the BRI initiative of the, uh, China. Uh, one of the, there are so many factors uh, available in this region, which is avoiding the region to do better as it is being expected. And one of those uh, major challenges, uh, which from my point of view personally, I can see uh, is the competition between a competition and influence of the uh, global powers and the regional powers within the Kamka region, including the United States of America, uh, that uh, they have spent uh, more than $130 billion in the combat and the fight against the Taliban, the Al-Qaeda and the terrorism for the past two decades, uh, two decades uh, for the purpose of influencing and penetrating their influence into the other uh, Kamka region countries. But unfortunately, uh, since end of February, since the peace deal has been signed between the Taliban and uh, the United States of America, Literally, it shows that the fight between the U.S. and Taliban is over. The past efforts which has been put, and it cost billions of dollars for the United States, it has been uh, failed. Uh, mostly, the Afghan economy, I can say, is mostly dependent, instead of being dependent on the economical indexes and factors, it's mostly dependent on the peace deal and the peace processes that should happen, we, we hope so. Uh, but uh, the negotiation teams from the government side has been created, and soon we are expecting that the peace deal negotiations to be started between the Taliban uh, and the government of Afghanistan. And as soon as we'll be having uh, good results, and as soon as we'll be having uh, a, a good peace deal in place that should be acceptable for all the stakeholders in the region and all the stakeholders in the country, uh, then uh, we're, we're going to be having huge potentials in terms of doing more trade, in terms of uh, bringing more investments from outside Afghanistan, from the region and out of the region, into the potential sectors which we uh, got in, in the country. Uh, uh, now, uh, uh, at the same time, we can see that the China, as I said, is uh, trying to uh, in, uh, penetrate and influence to the BRI uh, project, uh, which is somehow for the benefit of the region, because the amount of funding and financing which the region requires for the infrastructure project is quite large. It's billions and trillions of dollars, which none of the countries uh, can afford that one. But at least for those small and medium-sized infrastructure projects like TAPI project, which, uh, uh, which will cost only around $2 billion, but is still uh, the project has not been completed due to the lack of funding and financing uh, uh, from Turkmenistan and Afghanistan and the countries in the region. Uh, uh, the countries can, sh can put their shared resources for the purpose of completion of those regional integration and infrastructure projects like TAPI, like TASA 1000 project and uh, many more uh, that it can uh, bring in more connectivity uh, uh, within the region. On the other side, we can see that influence of Russia, uh, since they're thinking that uh, the Soviet Union that the, in the past they have, been uh, they have been investing in this region and they have so many cultural ties. Uh, they have uh, so many pro-Russian people are still living in this uh, region. The Russian government and the Russian politicians are thinking that this is their region and they should have more influence than the United States of America and in China or any other powers of the region. And, and the work over here. While the Russia is not spending money in terms of uh, the development of the countries in, in the region, and at the same time, this is creating a great opportunity for the United States of America in order to focus more and invest more on the economic integration and uh, infrastructure connectivity uh, projects uh, of the region. And at the end, I would like to end my talking points with what we're uh, doing over here. Uh, myself, for example, and my team and my colleagues in Afghanistan as a young generation of the country that we are focusing a lot in bringing investments uh, from outside Afghanistan into the country and to create connectivity and linkages between Afghanistan and rest of the countries. We have founded the International Chamber of Commerce four years back and we we're working shoulder to shoulder with the government of Afghanistan and recently we have uh, brought and founded the World Trade Center 
uh, into Afghanistan that the project has gone on and by next year we are expecting that the uh, services of the World Trade Center for the purpose of promoting more trade and investments in Afghanistan and between the region uh, is going to be uh, started. Uh, we, we need, uh, uh, as I mentioned, we need uh, a specific uh, regional policy integrations that should happen between uh, the countries of the region. For example, a free bilateral and multilateral free trade agreements needed to be in place in order to boost and increase the level of trade volumes between the countries, which is not existing. Not for all the commodities, for all the products, but for specific commodities that each and a specific each country of the region, they have absolute advantage on, on, on that one. We need, uh, for the purpose of safeguarding the investors of one country that who are moving to invest in another country, for example, since two years back, uh, so many Afghan investors has went to Uzbekistan and they have invested in, in different sectors, including ourselves and our company, which went to Uzbekistan. But investors from the region moving to another country, they are not feeling safe due to the lack of uh, the bilateral and multilateral treaty investment agreements, which is not in place uh, between the countries uh, uh, of the region. And also uh, the international institutions like the Central Asia Caucasus Institutes, Chambers of Commerce of the National and International World Trade Centers, uh, business councils that Nuna would be focusing more on that one. I believe that the Kamka Business Council is also going to be, is supposed to be started. Uh, these institutions can uh, support a lot in terms of creating and encouraging more policy dialogues in between the countries until we reach to a unified uh, policy agreements in terms of promotion of more trade and investments in the region. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We were to have had our next speaker from Kazakhstan, our good friend Rahim Ashakbayev, director of the Center of Applied Research a lot. Uh, and unfortunately, Rahim reported an hour and a half ago that he seems to have a fever. We hope uh, it's not the real thing and that he's already feeling better, but he cannot join us because of that, and we wish him well. Uh, it, now, this would never have happened t 10 years ago, but uh, interestingly, uh, we're going to turn to Sardar Muhammad Aliyev, again from Uzbekistan, uh, to offer a comment as an observer of, of, of Kazakhstan. As I say, 10 years ago, neither would have volunteered to comment on the other, and now it seems quite normal, which is evidence of what we're talking about. Sardar. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, we wish uh, our friend Rahim the fastest recovery and uh, get back to the track. Uh, so just want to give uh, shortly on the, how Kazakhstan is doing. Uh, Kazakhstan is doing in terms of uh, trade uh, with the neighbors and the, his uh, major uh, player in terms of the policy and the interregional trade. And if you look at the numbers for the last year, Kazakhstan was a major contributor of uh, trade in Kamka region. So uh, Kazakhstan uh, trade turnover in Kamka region was uh, $5.2 billion. Uh, dollars. Uh, here, the export is uh, privileging. It's $4 billion was an export, and only $1.2 uh, billion was an import. And of course, here, uh, Kazakhstan's main uh, trade partner is Uzbekistan, because, uh, as you know, uh, for the last three years, uh, Uzbekistan is... Uh, Changed. I mean, the, for, for the in terms of the trade policy, a lot of good things are happening uh, in terms of also investments because uh, as we took in Uzbekistan, the export barriers. I mean, the three years ago it was very difficult to make a money conversion. Now you don't have these issues, and also uh, the exporting uh, companies were the mostly monopolized, and uh, you you have in the one sector of economy a specialized uh, monopolized. The, companies now these barriers are gone so now in uzbekistan any company can export uh, and the the situation and environment uh, is improving so uh, kazakhstan is uh, making uh, also playing a major role in the <clears throat> central asia uh, in cis uh, as a geographically and uh, geographically politically and also in terms of the gdp uh, 
uh, and it's a part of uh, several uh, organizations uh, like a, a Eurasian uh, Union, uh, like uh, CIS uh, and others. Uh, so uh, Kazakhstan is also participating uh, in BRI initiative and it's uh, one of the most uh, located in the center of the heart of the of this region and uh, it has a good corridors and an access to the Caspian Sea uh, which has a better uh, trade uh, possibilities uh, considering to the other countries. So uh, these are the short uh, short update in terms of the Kazakhstan. Of course uh, if Rahim could join he will tell us some more uh, what's happening uh, now there. So we wish him the fastest recovery. Thank you very much. Uh, grateful to you too, Sardor. We're now going to turn to Nona Mumalashvili from Georgia. She's speaking to us from Tbilisi. She's founder and chairwoman of the Caucasus Economic Policy Institute and vice president of the International Chamber of Commerce of Georgia. Nona. Thank you, Dr. Sir, and uh, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to be on this panel. I would have preferred, honestly, to be now in the beautiful Almaty and enjoy the company of the fellows and the participants in person. But unfortunately, you know, due to the very unexpected circumstances, we have to uh, go through this uh, through the e-communication, which is not my favorite. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we this is the only way that we can uh, communicate today until further, you know. The, 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 the global uh, stabilization of the environment. So my presentation, I will not, I will not give a lot of numbers because my colleagues here already presented a lot of, uh, a lot of statistics regarding the region. A few words about about Georgia and the recent uh, and uh, and the, the recent environment. And I will uh, mostly and afterwards I will mostly focus on the global perspective of the Kamka region and the potential that the Kamka region is having uh, in the in the in the current period. Uh, uh, so 2020 has been the challenging year and not a single country had, around the world has managed to avoid or escape the pandemic and Georgia was no exception. So Georgia so far counts uh, about 800 confirmed cases and uh, um, almost 700 recovered cases. With these statistics, the international press named Georgia as the uh, success case in fighting in fighting the pandemic. So measures taken by the government were mostly pretty much the same as by uh, by many other countries, uh, and uh, the strict economic and social measures have been have been introduced in order to as a response strategy to the disease in order to counterbalance not very strong healthcare system, which is very typical for the developing countries and, as it seems, not only for the developing countries. Uh, so, though, uh, though the measures that uh, to contain the virus have been very efficient for us, the damage done to the economy has been uh, dramatic. Uh, and unfortunately for now, we do not see the full-fledged impact and it still needs to be cal calculated. But the role of the international assistance has been very significant and uh, our Western partners have um, secured about 1.5 billion uh, US dollars in assistance to Georgia's economic recovery and more is coming from the EU. Now, as per recent, EU, as the recent World Bank report on the economic prospects uh, of the region, uh, unsurprisingly, we are heading to the deepest global recession in decades. So as for the South Caucasus countries, uh, the drop in the GDP in Armenia only is two, for 2020 is 2.8%, in Azerbaijan 2.6%, and in Georgia 4.8%, uh, which, uh, which is pushing the Georgia's economy into the recession. Um, the foreign direct investment have fallen in Georgia by 50% in the first quarter, and the imposition of the of the lockdown is expected is, is expecting to push again, as I said, the country into further recession. Uh, well, in, uh, in order and in parallel, let's see what is happening in the region and globally. First of all, the changes within the region itself has increased the motivation from the major powers uh, to review the potential and opportunities in the region. As we have seen that the U.S. strategy for Central Asia 2025 on advancing the sovereignty and economic prosperity, uh, the strategy outlines the, uh, the, and has the objective uh, on the, of the promotion of the U.S. investment and development in the Kamka region in Central Asia. 
At the same time, we're seeing Uzbekistan itself applying for to join the EU trading scheme, EU generalized scheme of preferences plus, which uh, now actually is um, easing the tariffs for developing countries if they improve, of course, their human rights uh, records. So obtaining the status of the beneficiary of the GSP plus uh, will create a solid foundation for Uzbekistan for sustainable growth and diversification of export, which uh, again will serve uh, and will be beneficial for the, for the foreign economic ties with, with, with the European Union. Now, another big neighbor, Turkey, is becoming very active in the region and Turkey has recently announced the creation of the Turkish-led Turkey Council that will focus on uh, Central Asia and Caucasus countries, and it will set initial um, investment of 500, uh, of 500 million to boost the economic links between the member states. And for now, the member states are Turkey, Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Kazakhstan, with, the, with Turkmenistan being an, being an observer. Azal. So although they have very, a bit different design, the Russian-led Eurasian uh, Economic Union uh, which is being an international organization with administrative apparatus and the China's BRI being more of an investment program, both initiatives aim, aim to enhance the economic relationship with, uh, with, uh, with the Central Asian region. So, as we're seeing, the country countries play a very important role as a bridge between Europe and, and, and Asia. Intensifying the regional cooperation is an important step forward in order to access global, uh, global markets and, and the expansion of interregional trade uh, is crucial for this. Now, as the, as the Kamka Fellowship uh, Network, what can we do? And as we have discussed, and what is our part of the, of the participation and contribution into this, as we have discussed back uh, in November in DC, um, the possibility of the creation of the Kamka Business Council uh, could be an important contribution to the further development of the intra-regional trade. So uh, the existing economic platforms today, in most cases, they miss the larger regional perspective. And Kamha Business Council has the potential to become the, uh, one of the multiple tracks promoting the regional cooperation. So the groundwork for this has already been done. We just need to institutionalize this. And in conclusion, I would like to say that the pragmatic and sustainable long-term development strategy for Kamka countries should place the trade, including, including inter-regional trade, on high agenda for uh, the Kamka, uh, for the Kamka countries, and Kamka Business Council is a natural starting point for this. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a very challenging set of reports, but I want to just note something as we turn to questions. I'd like to take the opportunity to ask the first question, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Shukrat Nerzoyev to to receive questions from from our viewers. Uh, but there there's one thing that strikes me about all your reports. They're 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 very knowledgeable. They're very, these are authoritative based on, on the best international data. It's most impressive. On the other hand, they're all from a rather high output. And I think of myself now uh, coming into any of your capital cities or major trading centers, let's say 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, you would have had all sorts of people bustling around talking about deals and so on and and and, and an extremely tactile and, and concrete and practical level. So what I'd like to ask each of you, just telegraphically, don't take but a minute or two in responding, to give me one example from your country's experience, including your friends, including yourself, of what you see as the kind of intra-regional trade and economic activity that, that, that the future can hold. Any takers? Two cards. Um, I certainly, thanks for the question. Uh, very interesting. I think um, this is a question for dreamers as well as practitioners. Um, in terms of practicalities of vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the challenges that, uh, that each one of our countries is facing, I think uh, um, most businesses um, uh, are uh, introducing electronic services, um, uh, but they're quite constrained by uh, existing uh, fiber optic challenges, broadband connectivity um, shortages, and, and a number of other 
technical and uh, and um, uh, institutional constraints. But I uh, I do see that uh, many businesses, although they have not uh, necessarily digitized their services, that they would like to very much do so uh, in the near future. So I definitely see. Um, a great potential in uh, um, electronic um, services, in digitizing service provision, and in uh, in electronic commerce more broadly, um, uh, as the uh, connecting factor factor among the Kamka uh, Kamka economies. Um, moving uh, moving forward, as a dreamer, um, of course, uh, that um, um, that would also imply um, having greater intensity of trade in terms of energy connectivity. Uh, we're already seeing signs, very good signs, uh, at least in the Central Asia region, of um, flagship projects being uh, going forward uh, with the support of international development partners. And there seems to be a firm commitment from national governments as well. One of the uh, good examples is CASA 1000, which was already mentioned, I think, by Zabiola as well. Um, uh, CASA 1000 um, fits very nicely into this um, idea of having uh, uh, a unified um, uh, Central Asia regional energy market, which is also supported uh, incidentally by the US through USAID. Uh, so this, uh, this I think, um, has the greatest potential uh, in terms of not only uh, uh, creating jobs, but also boosting trade and, uh, and trade intensity among, uh, among our countries. And very, at a very practical level, yeah. Thank you, uh, Sardor. Yes, I would like to also share uh, one of uh, our friends and other countries who are coming uh, with the real investments. So we can just, uh, as an example, get uh, Uzbekistan's case. Uh, you know, the last year, uh, the Kazakhstan's biggest bank, Halek Bank, is here opened in Uzbekistan branch, like a Tenge Bank, and also Georgia's TCB Bank is also open uh, and the bank here in Uzbekistan. Another thing on the tech part, uh, uh, Colossa Group came also with the uh, Elon here, and uh, other companies, our fintech companies, are coming to the market. Now in Uzbekistan, it's a construction boom, and uh, one of the biggest uh, Kazakh uh, construction company like BI Group uh, here also came to the market uh, together with uh, Murad Buildings uh, started the projects here and uh, started construction. So it means the region is interesting and the investors are coming. So it, it, it's a good sign and the real cases. Thank you. Zabi Rova. Give us Thank you, example. Sure. I would like to give an example of uh, one of our friends that he is an investor and although he's in the banking sector as well and he, since two years back, he wanted to invest on the hospitality sector in developing hotel properties in Uzbekistan. Uh, although they have entered into the market for the purpose of investing over there because Uzbekistan in the region is one of the countries which they are providing very good opportunities for the foreign investors and specifically from the region who are coming to invest in Uzbekistan. For example, they gave the free land for investors, they gave it free tax holidays for a certain number of years to attract foreign direct investments, but they put some uh, limitations and some caps and some benchmarks that the investors has to complete down. For example, they put a specific period of time for a specific project that the project has to be completed. They limit the amount of the investment that has to be brought by the foreign investors into that uh, project and also the number of jobs that has to be created in Uzbekistan, which are not bad, it's quite uh, good. But one, one of the challenges that the foreign investors have been facing, and uh, an example of that one is my friend regarding the legislative and the laws and regulations over there. Still, there is no specific and uh, pro-investor laws and regulations for the investor available in Uzbekistan. And this is causing so many investors that when they're moving to Uzbekistan for the purpose of investing, they go to some level and then they drop back and they, they don't feel safe in order to invest uh, more of their funding over there. Another challenge is also in terms of the movement of the the banking sector is not, not quite easy in terms of the movement of the funds from a country to a country. And when an investor is bringing their money into Uzbekistan, they feel that the gate is stuck and they cannot move their funding back out of Uzbekistan. These are the two uh, practical challenges that people have faced. 
Uh, uh, Sabi I just want to comment on the part. Uh, before, yeah, it was uh, some difficulties on the getting the money back from the Uzbekistan. But the, currently, at least for the last year, uh, we didn't hear so much about this kind of issues. I mean, because we were operating and uh, if you are operating well and uh, everything is good on the basis of taxes, I mean, the, we don't see any issue. I mean, getting back your money from the Uzbekistan. No, no, Mama, Mama what yes, you, well, I'm, I have two, two things to, to focus on uh, and talking about the dreamers, but this one is for, for, for Rusudan mostly. One of them uh, that I would work on is the, is the tourism promotion, uh, inter-regional tourism, because, uh, you know, there is an institutional memory coming back. We are all coming back from the same history. There is an institutional memory uh, within the republics. And um, unfortunately, the inter-regional tourism is not that developed. Uh, and the infrastructure is not that developed in order to promote the inter-regional tourism, which has the great potential. Imagine 130 million population market, uh, and this market does not trade with each other that effectively and that efficiently and does not travel among each other that uh, actively. So this would be one part of it. And the second one, I actually tried to work with some of the donors on this project, was the creation of the uh, e-commerce uh, network, like co like something like Alibaba, but for the Kanka region, in order to promote the local artisans, the local production, because our region is still out of uh, many many countries is still producing a lot handmade products, carpets, jewelry, the uh, anything that is value va valued in the in in the Western world. There is no one single platform that is promoting the local artisans, and this was one of the projects I started working on. Unfortunately, the pandemic happened and. Uh, it, uh, we put it on hold, but I hope that this will develop into a uh, very successful project at some point. Very interesting. Uh, I want to return to you uh, because we want to hear uh, at the end uh, about the project to develop a, a platform for exchange of economic and investment and joint project ideas within Kamka. So we'll. we'll Return to you, but meanwhile, uh, can we turn to Shukrat and ask if we have any questions and comments coming from our what our viewers? Um, quite a lot. I think there is lively discussion um, and questions are popping up as we speak. Um, so I'll be um, reading uh, questions as we speak. I'm mindful of the time as well. We have, I think, about just less than 30 minutes remaining, so short answers are um, appreciated, um, as always. Um, the first question um, comes from uh, Hulan. Um, what is the best uh, starting point for startups uh, to leverage on the Kamka network to distribute their products? Um, and the follow-up question to that, is there a regional trade organization that would be a good starting point to find distributors? Um, Mm -hmm. This is a very technical point for practitioners. Uh, <laughs> um, who would like to, to, to take that on? Um, okay. Sardor? Yes, uh, in terms of the startups, uh, I would like uh, to give some points. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, there is a you know, International Astana Finance Center and uh, there is an Astana Hub. Uh, so, and they have a very good preferences for the regional startups, including with the mentorship program, investment program. Uh, and that you can uh, learn, get the mentors and approve your prototype of your product or services. And uh, they have a good really platform as a starting point for any startup can be, for example, the Astana Hub. Now, another thing is uh, in Tashkent, uh, we have also the IT park. You can also try there. Uh, I mean, the, at least these two. And I know in uh, Caucasus, uh, Armenia is also doing well in terms of IT. I'm sure that uh, in the countries you can also find uh, good support for your starting tech startups. Okay, um, thanks. Um, anyone else would like to, um, to respond or share views? Uh, well, I will actually, uh, and uh, now um, I know this question is coming, but I will I will do it in advance. So, uh, once we have uh, the Kamka Business Council established 
we will be your uh, focal point in order to help you to find the distributors and find other contacts within the Kamka region and in the US. Uh, and uh, once the world returns to new normal, I hope that will be pretty much soon. I think the Kamka Business Council, uh, as we discussed, has been already, um, the groundwork has been done. We'll just need to institutionalize it and we'll be your natural ally in order to help you to promote your businesses. Uh, Shorat, I would like to uh, put a comment in this question as well. Uh, actually, in the past, uh, it's a bit challenging for the startups. There are so many startups in this region, including in Afghanistan, in Uzbekistan, in Kazakhstan, and all of them. And these startups, basically, they are having so many good ideas, and they're producing very quality products, most of them, and quality services as well, which is needed for sure, obviously, for the region. But uh, due to uh, their size of the business, that they are mostly small businesses, they don't have that capacity to expand and to uh, export their products uh, uh, to the other countries in the region. As I mentioned before, for example, the uh, World Trade Center project is currently under construction in Kazakhstan and WTC is currently construction in, in Afghanistan as well. So availability of the World Trade Centers in the region and if more WTCs to be coming up in other countries, this is going to be a focal point, a platform in order to create connectivity and connect the investors and the business startups with the other investors and other startups in the region. Plus, digitalization of the economies is something that it can support them a lot in terms of finding new markets for their products and services into uh, the region. Uh, and at the same time, in the past, since before the pandemic, there were so many exhibitions which was happening uh, in between the countries, which was creating an opportunity for the startups and the producers to come and meet and find their right partners in the region for the purpose of expanding the markets. But since the, the, the pandemic has still gone on, there's no uh, clear point that when it's gonna over, uh, conducting of uh, platforms and networking through the webinars by the national chambers, by the ICCs in the region, and by the business councils and the uh, uh, chambers, regional chambers, for example, the Kamka Business Council can play a very vital and important role in terms of creating that connectivity and creating that opportunity for the startups to meet and find their partners. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question um, is from Bakai. Um, uh, what would be your views on how Kamka countries can benefit from rivalry of superpowers? Um, this is a very interesting question. This is a PhD question. But, um, I think that you uh, uh, partly responded to it. Uh, I would like uh, to add a little bit more on that, yeah. Feature. Right. Um, so um, what I would like to do is maybe give floor to, um, to others to share their views, and I'll, I'll do the same. Um, Okay, can I start it first, uh, Shura? Sure, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Actually, as you mentioned, it's a very, very critical uh, question. That uh, I read that question also in the question and answer box that uh, China is through the BRI project when they are approaching and influencing into the new markets and the new countries in the Kamka region, they are waiving their national debts of that respective country and what the United States is going to be offering and what Russia is going to be offering. As I mentioned just uh, very brief in my talking points, the, we, we can see a very clear and a very tough competition between the superpowers in this region. As I said, the United States of America, only for the last two decades of war, they spent $130 billion. And now the DFC, a new institution which has been established in Washington DC, and it's a merger of the uh, previous OPEC, or Overseas Private Investment Corporation, with some other agencies, they have got billions of dollars, and it's available for the purpose of investing into regional infrastructure energy projects as of my as of my knowledge and that's not only specific for afghanistan but that funding is available for most of the countries uh, into the region at the same time china is trying to increase their influence through penetrating into the other countries by giving opportunities for uh, investors and also for the countries for the states through the BRI project and uh, Russia is still keeping quiet and looking from out of the box what's happening. They're not spending money, but still they want to be somehow uh, under the, uh, having the control of uh, the region. So the, the basically it's, it's a tough competition between US and uh, China right now into the region. But I can say that as we have a 
a proverb that a, a friend in bad time is a friend in good time. So Uhaywar is going to be doing more for the purpose of bringing more stabi stability and bringing, creating more infrastructure projects. I think those are going to be the good friends of the region and the country, and they would end of the day benefit uh, from paying for the others. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Uh, I want to just uh, mention about uh, ex uh, in terms of export because if you, if you see the region like a Kamka, we are the big uh, space but uh, with maybe not so uh, much with the products and uh, we should look at our neighboring countries I mean the big countries like uh, Russia, China and you know by uniting getting together this can be really huge market uh, I mean the exporting to this market so uh, and in some cases uh, just uh, the countries cannot provide enough sufficient products you know but the demand is really huge so uh, by uniting by making some corporations it can be really good and the real competitive advantage to increase the trade opportunities of the region for the superpowers okay thank you um, I'll just add um, one final thought to that question before we move on to the next one. Um, I'm still very uneasy about the fact that uh, um, some of our countries in the region, particularly smaller economies like Tajikistan and Kyrgyz Republic, but also Uzbekistan as well, as a matter of fact, are um, very dependent on, uh, on Russia, for example, uh, through the remittances channel. Um, there are massive numbers of labor migrants currently uh, in Russia without opportunity of getting back home during the, uh, the COVID outbreak and, and uh, restrictions that have been imposed uh, as a result. Um, and they have been persistently dependent um, um, uh, on remittances for, uh, for a good number of years. I think one of the ways of sort of using, leveraging um, the ability of other superpowers like China and then the US and, and, uh, and a number of others too, um, uh, to, to help uh, balance um, uh, the game uh, in the region is, um, is to help create jobs back at home, uh, through back at home in our countries, uh, respective countries, through investment in key industries. I think that's, that's already been happening, although uh, it has been um, uh, quite difficult to attract, for example, um, U.S. Uh, investments, uh, private investments into uh, Central Asia region, with the exception maybe of, uh, uh, of Kazakhstan and perhaps emerging um, uh, opportunities in Uzbekistan. There are a few other opportunities and uh, an incidence of, uh, of uh, US investors or UK investors or, or, um, uh, or other European investors, for example, um, coming in and, uh, and expressing interest in, uh, uh, in the smaller economy. So this is one area uh, where I think um, uh, opportunities lie and, and this can be uh, a potential for balancing the game and also using uh, uh, some of the leverages that currently exist uh, through the uh, through the country economies. Um, I'll move on I'll move on to the next question. Um, there are quite a few. I'm uh, afraid that me that we may not be able to, uh, to read uh, all of them so I, I'll try to combine uh, as much as possible. Um, uh, one other question uh, from Irakli, uh, question to Shukrat uh, and Sardor. Is there any estimation what would be the reduction in uh, percentage terms of remittances uh, from abroad in 2020 due to COVID-19? Um, uh, Sardor, would you like to, to take that up first? <laughs> no, uh, we, don't, we don't have a clear number, so this is may, maybe Shukrat, you can comment. Okay. Um, uh, no, I don't. Uh, I don't think I have the crystal ball either. Um, it's just um, the matter of uh, uh, making sure that we know uh, all the uncertainties that lie ahead, because um, we um, uh, cannot be sure that the second wave is not going to hit in, and at least some of our countries. Uh, so this is one one threat, one uncertainty. Another one is uh, is um, uh, obviously what happens to. Um, uh, to our government's policies with regards to restrictions and border closures that have been uh, imposed a few months back. So is this still going to be on uh, or are these restrictions going to be lifted anytime soon? So a lot of, uh, uh, there are a lot of variables in that equation. Uh, although I think that's my own sort of hypothetical is that the that remittances might, just might uh, drop um, around 30, 35% of GDP um, um, as far as Tajikistan is concerned uh, in 2020. But that is, uh, uh, please take it with a grain of salt. 
Um, so, uh, moving on to the next question. Um, right, uh, from uh, Farouk uh, Il Nazarov. Um, who are the winners of COVID-19 pandemic in your countries, if any? Um, in other words, what industries did benefit? Um, Nona, uh, would you like to, uh, to take that one first? Uh, well, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. Well, this is very difficult to, uh, to say who are the winners. I don't think anybody is the winner. The winner are the people uh, who uh, actually uh, managed to um, contain the pandemic and the governments managed to contain the pandemic with the minimal losses. Well, some industries that have uh, seen the profit, we could name only pharma probably and, uh, and some e-commerces mostly, uh, but uh, I, wouldn't count about, I wouldn't count winners and losers. I mean, the whole world is uh, uh, affected and uh, all of us have suffered. So we don't have the winners so far. Uh, but once we have uh, the vaccine and uh, we reserve, we, we we go back to normal. Uh, I think all of us will be winners. So I cannot I cannot name any particular uh, business that won out of it. Uh, I, I can I can comment a few just. Uh, uh, so who are the winners? Yeah, uh, mainly e-commerce and delivery services, the tech companies who were ready and the, the companies who were already put their uh, services or products online because these are, these are the less affected industries and these companies uh, get the easier uh, from this uh, crisis. It was the last effect. And also the companies, the FMCG companies who were selling the safety products they also i mean the win i hope and uh, and also the farmer that mentioned uh, the internet and the telco is also less affected uh, so because people were trying to use more internet more data and also these companies also had uh, i mean the positive effect thank you Zabila? Yeah, actually it was uh, answered by Nona and uh, Sarjan, but I would like to uh, add a little bit more on that one. Still, the, the region has not uh, reached the peak, uh, but uh, we should be, I'm, I'm not a pessimistic person, I'm a very optimistic person, but I can see unfortunately that the number of the affection is increasing day by day to all regions. And uh, unfortunately the world is talking about the second wave and the third wave that so far uh, neither Afghanistan nor rest of the countries has reached to the peak of even the first wave. Uh, looking into the number of uh, factions into Afghanistan, unfortunately, I can see that we are approaching to the peak because every day, apart from those numbers which is being announced by the government or through the platforms, uh, due to the complexity or due to the nature of the culture in Afghanistan, unfortunately, most of the people that who have been affected, I can see that in in 80% of the families, at least in Kabul, one or two or three people have been affected. Although majority have been recovered without going to, to the hospitals by using their classic way of using a balloon and uh, some oxygen pipe to just putting in their mouth and breathing down to facilitate breathing and using some typical uh, medication into the country. Uh, but the mortality rate is increasing. We have uh, one of, we are, we are one of the countries which we have the, the, the most uh, probably mortality rate in comparing to the number of afflictions and the number of people that have been uh, recovered. So we should be expecting, unfortunately, uh, bad days and worse days. And uh, the only winner could be the entire region that they have to work together, they have to cooperate together, and they have to fight and combat uh, to stop and to prevent the outbreak of the COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very interesting question on um, um, uh, regional competition, um, uh, particularly in Central Asia between Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. So I guess this is a question for Sardor, um, since you've been um, living two lives uh, <laughs> pretty much across these countries. Um, uh, this is a question from Jenny. Uh, there has obviously been regional competition going on, uh, especially after new Uzbekistan government reforms. Um, in the context of Central Asia, uh, the regional competition remains stronger between Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. How can our countries remain competitive, uh, retain our competitive advantages while promoting collaboration and trade cooperation? 
such as China, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan Railway, China, Kazakhstan Railway, uh, etc. So uh, on to you, Sardor, please. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Really great question. And uh, I, I would say, uh, yeah, in some uh, part of the economic, there can be competition. But uh, overall, I would say that because, you know, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, these are brotherhood countries. And they have, uh, from the long period, they have very uh, good uh, relationship in terms of, I mean, the human trade, the politics between the country leaders. But of course, this uh, period, I mean, the, for the last, uh, if you see, 25, 30 years, uh, Kazakhstan uh, managed better in terms of the economics uh, and the development and the improved their uh, multilateral trade uh, opportunities. Uh, but Uzbekistan also did well in some terms of uh, industries, especially in the agriculture, the textile, the automobiles, you know. So, uh, and the, as the countries opened up uh, for the last three years, uh, the, most, of the uh, most of the investors are looking up with opportunistic to Uzbekistan and uh, coming uh, a lot of big players, investors, because, you know, the, most of the niches are still empty in uh, Uzbekistan, not so much the big multinational players. So uh, if you are interested uh, really in the investment opportunities, uh, so you should come and check the opportunities in Uzbekistan because it's a really great uh, country with a 34 million population and it can be a good market for the new uh, new directions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, another question uh, from Aziz Khan and we're uh, uh, returning to the discussion on uh, uh, superpowers. Uh, but that's uh, related specifically to China. Um, the question is um, about uh, debt forgiveness. Uh, in addition to its ambitious projects, uh, One Road, One Belt, communistic China started to forgive, forgive the debts to some countries. Uh, China places in Kamka region is extremely important. Even today, meeting is taking place thanks to China optical fiber internet channel. Um, so my question is, uh, what would be the position of other superpowers if China starts to forgive the debts to Kamka countries? Um, uh, perhaps I'll, I'll just share a very quick views on this one, uh, and I'll be very skeptical. I think we're getting uh, again into the realms of hypotheticals. I think it is highly unlikely that uh, China is going to um, uh, lose its uh, very important leverage um, that, that it uses to, to advance its economic uh, and, and security interests. Uh, and I'm thinking uh, from the perspective of someone who lives uh, and breathes in Tajikistan. Uh, Tajikistan is a, is a very small country, very highly dependent, um, um, such as the case over the past 15, uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, it uh, increased its dependency on China very significantly. Um, so that forgiveness is obviously the first thing that springs to mind as far as um, uh, countering the implications of COVID-19. But uh, I think uh, that forgiveness generally uh, is going to set a very dangerous precedent. Uh, and China obviously recognizes that. And I think it is highly unlikely that uh, uh, that, that forgiveness, uh, as opposed to uh, that restructuring, is going to actually take place. Uh, but that's, that's my um, very, very subjective uh, view on this one. Please, anyone else would like to share views on this question? Thank you. I already shared my, my views, I think, previously about this question also, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sardor, Nona? Yes, well, uh, first, uh, I would like to say uh, there is one uh, very uh, interesting English expression. There is no such thing as free dinner. Uh, so I don't think that they, uh, the China will be uh, giving up the money uh, just like this, you know, and forgiving the debts. I think it's just rather the debt restructuring rather than forgiving the debt, and this is what it is about. Though in the media we have seen that advertised differently. Right. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're on the same page uh, on this one. Um, Right, uh, qu another question from uh, Team Ospanov, uh, and I'm looking at the time again, very, very, uh, very brief responses um, are appreciated. Um, I believe that Afghanistan will be a key to the, will be key to the Kamka region uh, logistics wise. Um, and the most important question will be which rail gauge system, Russian wide gauge or European Chinese uh, narrow gauge um, Afghans choose? What are your opinions on this matter, please? Um, Sabiola, would you like to? Thank you. 
Sure. Actually, uh, the main question is very technical, and I'm not that uh, I don't have that expertise from the railway that I should know that, for example, which railway gauge is being used. Uh, I, I believe uh, it could be probably the same gauge that you sh uh, which is being used in other central countries <coughs> with the proper connectivity between Afghanistan and the rest of the countries in the region. Uh, but for the first par part that he uh, mentioned about Daman, that uh, Afghanistan is very critical for the connectivity of the region, not only for the region between the Central Asia and the South Asia, because uh, Afghanistan is geographically and geopolitically located into the heart of Asia, which we call it, and uh, the only bridge between Central Asia and the South Asia, where the Central Asia is the producers of energy, and these countries are full of energy, like natural gas, hydrocarbons, electricity, and uh, many more. And the South Asia, with a huge population of more than 2.1 billion, they are in need of, and there's a huge demand for those uh, uh, communities, uh, which has to be transmitted from the Central Asia to the South Asia. The only way which we can take down is through the railway connectivity, and at the same time for taking Afghanistan goods for exporting out of the region through the Central Asia to China, to Russia, uh, to Europe through the uh, Europe. Uh, uh, Caspian Corridor, which has uh, already been operating since two, two years' time. Uh, I, I believe that, that that's all, yeah. Thank you, um, thank you very much. Sorry, I think we time is up. Yeah. Can uh, I ask just one more question? I think we have about three or four more minutes. Um, I think there is room for just one more question. Go ahead. There is a lot more. Um, we're just accommodating one more. Uh, from uh, Rafshan. Um, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and the plunge in commodity prices are causing significant economic and social impacts in the Kanka region. Um, larger economies are coping up through containment measures. However, it is too costly for smaller economies, such as the Kyrgyz Republic and Tajikistan. What kind of measures should policymakers of smaller economies take to protect lives and livelihoods, given that their economies are already heavily indebted and cannot afford containment measures? Um, uh, again, uh, th this is, uh, I believe, another question uh, that merits more than uh, three remaining minutes uh, to respond to. But uh, my quick uh, take on this one is uh, my personal view, uh, because Tajikistan was mentioned, uh, uh, is the fact that um, uh, I think first and foremost, fiscal consolidation measures should, should come into play. Um, this is um, very important uh, when talking about, when thinking about protecting lives and livelihoods. Um, and that is obviously dependent on the ability of uh, the finance ministries uh, in the smaller economies to, to provide for a financial cushion um, that, is, that is required uh, and, uh, and ensure the targeted social assistance programs are in place. Obviously, that has um, uh, very little to do uh, with trade. Uh, Trade-wise, I think it is important to protect um, uh, tr uh, uh, imports of staple foods. Uh, because smaller economies have um, less ability um, uh, to, to produce uh, the required uh, uh, agricultural products uh, to provide for the su food supplies during uh, the times of crisis, such as, uh, such as this one, um, or economic downturn, not necessarily crisis. So uh, this, is, uh, this is important as far as, uh, as far as protecting the core of the trade structure um, and making sure that, that, that uh, vital um, uh, staple foods are coming into the country. Uh, so these are just two of the quick uh, thoughts that, that I have in my mind. Uh, anyone else would like to share? Yes, I would like to just uh, put a comment here, Shora. Uh, indeed, the majority of these countries in the region, they are having a smaller economy and for uh, definitely they have been negatively and adversely affected by the COVID-19. Uh, what I'm suggesting that has to be taken into consideration for the revival of the economy post COVID-19, especially those countries which they have a smaller economy like Kyrgyzstan, uh, Armenia, uh, Georgia, and also other countries in the region, that the governments of the countries need a, a very comprehensive uh, reforms in order to make sure that the adverse impact of the COVID-19 pandemic is being controlled to some certain level. But the uh, uh, regional powers of the world, including the United States and China, they can play an important role, a significant role in terms of safeguarding those countries with the small economies by injection of stimulus financial packages for the support of the business sectors, specifically the small and medium enterprises. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. I wish we had more time. We don't. Um, if I can offer a couple of quick comments. <clears throat> First of all, it's just a detail, but the, the old debate about which gauge do you use, that is 19th century imperialism talk. Uh, today you can switch, switch uh, from gauge to gauge uh, it's so fast, the new technologies, that, that that debate is just much less important than it used to be. That's a detail. Main thing, though, in this discussion, I, I'm struck between the, uh, the tension between doing things on a regional level, intra-regional level, and then handling effectively the possibilities and dangers from exter on the external side of the economy. And uh, you know, the question is, how do you handle that? And I mean, let, let me give us an example. Uh, uh, I hope you can see this. Imagine arm wrestling. That, that someone comes up to the two of you or the 10 of you and says, look, every time you arm wrestle, get the other guy's arm flat, you get a piece of gold. So if he gets it this way, it's gold one to one person. And if it's this way, the other guy gets the gold. And you, so what do they do? They start out by doing like this, just working like mad. But that's not very smart. They're competing with each other. They're neutralizing each other. Smart people figure out that the best way to deal with that is this. In other words, in other words, by by working together, they can maximize gold from every source. But that isn't happening in this region. It, it, there's talk about it. There have been meetings. It's not happening. Now, th this is not a, a, a trivial matter. You are in economic sense, either objects or subjects. The same is the political. Everyone talks about it in the political realm. You'll just be a minor outpost if you don't cooperate with each other, if you don't link arms and, and, do, and do this. Um, that, it seems to me, is, is a, just a fundamental truth. Um, it's interesting that the governments have had several meetings at a presidential level. There have been much more contact across the Caspian, much more contact with Afghanistan, beginning of contact with Mongolia, all countries with serious common interests. But curiously, in 2020, there really is no, the region doesn't exist in any structural sense. It really doesn't. It, it is, it is, and it is an invitation to external forces, whether political or economic, to divide and conquer, to play you off against each other, to give out rewards and punishments on the basis of your economic or political behavior. It doesn't work. So my, uh, this gets us to the question of, well, who's going to set up some sort of mechanisms for intra-regional discussion of economic issues? And I'd hoped the governments would have done it by now. Even before, they had plenty of time before the uh, epidemic. Uh, and there was talk. And there have been some meetings, but disappointingly little. So that opens a space, it seems to me, for business people like you all, like many people in the audience today, to set up some kind of communication network. Uh, and, and that is exactly what the Kafka Business Council is supposed to be, a, a, a channel of exchange of information. This isn't political. Information pertaining to the economy. How do you interact? How, whom do you call? Who do I, who can I, uh, Talk, talk with in this country, this city, uh, uh, when I come and make a visit. None of that exists in any serious way. There have been a preliminary conversation among a couple of the chambers of commerce, but these haven't gone half far enough. So let's hope, uh, let, let's hope that the Kanka Business Council, which our friend Nona is working to build, 
uh, that this becomes a reality. So, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the seventh annual Kafka meeting. Hundreds of people have participated uh, directly, but also indirectly through, through uh, Facebook and many, many other channels. Uh, I'm sure it's well up into the thousands now. Uh, and uh, especially important is that our large and growing group of, comp of, of, of fellows have, have been on the, uh, in the program of the Rumsfeld Foundation and the Central Asia Caucasus Institute, especially important. They're engaged and we stay in touch with them and they with each other. They are increasing these fellows are taking prominent roles in each of the countries they represent as our speakers today uh, exhibit. Now, many of them have worked very hard, especially the folks in Kazakhstan, who really expected this to take place in Almaty. And we want to all want to thank them very much. We also want to thank the staffs of the Rumsfeld Foundation and Central Asia Caucasus Institute, who have worked so hard to make this possible, especially David Sambadze, uh, uh, and, and of course, Sarah Tanucci and Bridget Chudlacek. Uh, they've really done a wonderful job. We're all in their debt. In closing, let me remind you that the next conference will take place next year in Almaty, Kazakhstan. We expect three to 500 participants. Urge you all to put it on your calendars now, next June, uh, and to tell your colleagues and friends and business friends to attend and speak up. And this is a good time to meet people from all over the region and to do exactly what we've been talking about in this very interesting session this morning, for which we want to thank specifically specifically our four participants and and wish uh, uh, in, in wish in closing that that uh, Rahim uh, Ashakbayev's uh, health is quickly acting on. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Starr. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Starr.